2024, where a nondescript black leather bag will set you back $5,000, where a Chloe silk mini dress will come in at 15000 where a simple Gucci white ribbed tank top will almost be $2,000. And what's that? The sound of a new Chanel price increase hitting the shops. The prices are getting higher and higher. Our patience is getting smaller. Does one's patience grow smaller? One's patience grows what? Thin. It's wearing... Our patience is wearing thin. <laughs> Has luxury pricing crossed the line? I don't know when it did, but we are far past that point. The thought of something being reasonable, that bracket keeps moving, you know? It used to be that like, oh, you could get a nice designer bag for under £1,000, $1,500. Now that boundary has been pushed out. It's like, okay, great, what can I get for under two? It's becoming ridiculous. And obviously, this is a generalisation, I'm really going to be talking about the big brands here, right? The heavy hitters, your Dior, Fendi, Gucci, Chanel, Louis Vuitton, all of those. Obviously, there are smaller, more emerging brands who have prices that reflect that. But even if you've been in this luxury game for a long time, this is kind of to a different level, the pricing. This isn't like, oh, okay, well, I kind of get it. It's out of my price range, but I understand it. I can kind of see where they've justified it there. The justifications, are they in the room with us? You know, they've been and gone. By its nature, luxury pricing is up there. But I would say over the last 18 months specifically, the number of price increases, the pricing of what seem to be very simply designed pieces and items has just become astronomical. And one way that we've kind of been seeing this is through new eras of creative directors, right? So Daniel Lee at Burberry, he left his po- well, we don't know what happened, but basically moved from Bottega Veneta to Burberry, changed the vibe, and with it, what was that? the prices. Let's take a Burberry bag. Just a general, easy, like a camera bag style. A simply designed Burberry bag would probably be priced between $1,000 to $1,500 pounds, maybe like max £1,250, right? Now, they start at $1,900 and go all the way up to $5,000 for a Burberry bag. Who is spending? $5,000 on a Burberry bag. Sabato Dasano at Gucci, a completely different, more minimalist era for the brand, toned down the vibe of the collections, but jacked up the price. <laughs> As I reiterate, the $1,700 tank top, the only thing that sets this apart from a tank top that you could get at Marks and Spencers or Target is the fact that it's got Gucci on the left hand side there of the strap. I did a, I did a video going a bit more in depth with all of the pricing and all of that, I'll have that linked below. But generally across the board, the prices are, oh, they've scooched up a bit. A Gabardine Parker slash Windbreaker, I don't know, it's sort of a, you know, a nylon looking nice, it's a nice looking jacket. Is it £2,700, $4,200 nice? No, it's not. I'll tell you that much because it is just navy and then it has like a little bit of patent leather here. Sorry, what? No, absolutely ridiculous. Chimena Kamali is the new creator director for Chloe. She showed her first collection for the brand Autumn Winter 2024 to rave reviews. I would say we were all excited. We were like, give us the ruffle, give us a tall over the knee leather boot worn with a flouncy little um, silk chiffon ruffly little dress. Give us the boho, I'm here for it, it's time has come, right? We were ready for the renaissance of Chloe. Especially because Chloe is one of those brands that like, whilst it is obviously luxury, it wasn't the price of like Gucci ready to wear, Fendi ready to wear, no, no, uh, Dior ready to wear, you know, it wasn't in that price category. So you can imagine my surprise when I went scrolling on the Mode Operandi trunk show when that came out to see the following. The large leather hobo bag, $4,900, okay, the most expensive bag, 
currently on the Chloe website, bearing in mind this is not like one that's particularly, you know, over embellished or like a special edition or something like that, is $3,650 over a thousand dollars difference there. The over the knee le leather boots, which I thought max would be £1,500, £1,800, £2,150. So that's what we're dealing with. So how are the brands justifying these prices? Well, they've really put it down to two main things. Cost of materials going up, um, within that is like cost of shipping, all of this. I know shipping prices have gone up and blah 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 and I don't know the ins and outs but so I've heard from other industries. Um, and also inflation. That darned little thing. However, I much more agree with uh, the post that Diet Prada did about this, which really, it seems like it's more about brand positioning than it is about covering their costs. WWD did a, a recent very interesting article about the aspirational luxury customer, and this is a very big part of this discussion. So, the aspirational luxury customer, as per WWD, is a cluster of spenders who both helped fuel the luxury boom post-pandemic, but then contributed to its stall as they cut back on spending, resulting in lower sales growth for major brands. Now, the aspirational customer covers a wide range of people. They've got McKinsey Consulting to basically break down the aspirational customer into five key groups. Number one, the status seekers. These are the people that are most interested in the pieces that signal that this is a designer item or this is something of note, whatever. Be that a very trendy piece that says something or more down the loud luxury route. The quality seekers. These tend to be um, aged 40 and over homeowners, largely driven by sustainability, right? That is the thing that they're most bothered about. And they are mainly based in Europe and the US. Socialite spenders. The yearly spend is higher than the other groups in this uh, within the aspirational luxury customer, but they are the least loyal in that they will buy up to eight different brands within the year. Timeless chic, however, are the most loyal. They will go back and back and back to the same brand or types of brands, and they are evenly distributed between the US, Europe and China. Those are the only sort of continent slash countries that they mention during this report. As we know, the spend across the world. And then you have the mindful minimalists. These are mature spenders, they mainly do online spending, and they really are only bothered about practical purchases. So they tend to buy mostly beauty, followed by clothing. When it comes to luxury brands and whatever, what they try to do is convert the aspirational luxury spender into a like fully fledged, a proper luxury consumer, as per this article. I don't know what it is that sort of converts them, but obviously these are very different groups of people that need to be addressed and the tactics for each are going to be different, right? Anyway. As the aspirational shopper is spending less, the brands, therefore, or, or what it seems to be like as a consumer, the aspirational luxury spender kicked by the wayside as they seem to be focusing more on the top, top, top VIC level spenders. The people that aren't going to care so much about the price increases or the new price of Chloe or whatever. So, Luca Salker of Bernstein estimates that the top 5% of luxury clients account for over 40% of sales for most brands. This was in a New York Times article, I believe last year. This kind of tracks when it comes to, ages ago when I did, I did a video about Gucci. I found a presentation, like an internal presentation they were using about sort of what their priorities are for 2024. What I found very interesting and what I've kind of been noticing on the runway is the use of a lot of exotics for a brand like Gucci. There's other brands as well. Uh, Dior is one of them that they're starting to show a lot more exotic bags on the runway. As we know, exotic bags are priced. Uh, it's like, oh, you know, here's a leather, nice little bag that we're used to buying exotics oh, I, I think I can barely see you up there in price. So I found this very interesting that like, oh, okay, why are we seeing a lot of like these crocodile loafers and these croc bags on the runway and blah, blah, blah. Well, partly what was sort of revealed by that presentation is that they are trying to appeal to this higher spend customer. The customer that's, that spends on an exotic bag is also the one that's buying ready to wear, is also the one that's buying the 
higher ticket merchandise. Now, many of us, although disappointed, would understand the pricing if the quality and customer service and customer experience was backed up, bolstered, improved, whatever it is, right? But Chanel, ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, they've just come out with their recent price increases, there was an interview with the president who basically, you know, we, we've seen the biannual price increases over the years, right? But in recent years, those little percentages have become big percentages. I think as of recording this, a medium classic flap is $10,800, that's up $600 from the last price increase. The Chanel 19s also went up, the boy bag went up, even the Chanel Kelly bag, newest member, not really to the classics, but that's gone up 11%. They also came out with a little film uh, that I don't know what they were planning on, like, what do you think that film is going to do? It's like, oh, the iconic Chanel bag, uh, featuring Penelope Cruz and Brad Pitt. I don't know if that was to justify it. It's like, oh, here's another price increase. But also, this is why our bag is so fantastic and that's why it's the same price as a Birkin. It was an interesting timing of those two. But we still see people complaining about quality, people having, um, you know, bad experiences, things like this. And yet Chanel also keeps reporting growth. Part of this that's also an underlying layer of the pricing and everything is that why must we always be growing? Why is growth that's not double digits oh they're doing terribly like can you not just coast for a few months at some point and then like be great why must everything anyway i don't know this is why i'm not a business person all oh, oh, a bunch of layered you know nonsense but chanel keeps reporting growth people keep buying I say me, you know, hang my head in shame. What's also interesting though, with all of these price increases and crazy pricing in general, I, what was I looking at the other day? Like there was like a Miu Miu skirt and it was like, oh yeah, that's 2000 and the matching jacket is like three and a half. And it's like five and a half thousand for a very simple, you know, like little, is it cute? Yes. Is it 5,500? No, no, it is categorically not. The secondhand market, uh, pre-love, the resale market can show quite easily what pricing works and what doesn't. Okay. Because as can also sales, we're seeing a lot of sales happening, like seasonal 30% off. You've got matches in liquidation doing a measly 25 but you know you're seeing these things go on sale quite often and then you're also seeing these pieces hit the resale market nowhere near that the price that people paid for them for example Bottega bags if you want to buy a Bottega Jody now you're going to get a great deal on the resale market even in sales they're, they're they're in sales now so you've got to sort of think if you're pricing at this price and you've got to cut the price for people to for you to shift your stock, was it a good idea to begin with? You know, like, couldn't you have just, I don't know, met in the middle, people still buy, and you don't have to put it on sale? I don't know, once again, I don't know the internet, I don't know the economic, I'm coming at this from a very high level, you know, point of view, as somebody who would rather not spend two grand on a, on a tank top. However, I will say this, I think that, as with all things, this is a bit depressing actually, everything's temporary right so i think that whilst we were in this stage of ridiculous pricing what goes up must come down they're not going to all of a sudden go oh classic laps five grand by the way but what we might see in the future and future collections is that when those collections come out the pricing isn't as horrendous as it currently is whilst the top 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 0.1 percent customer is still going to buy once you neglect the aspirational consumer, there's gonna be a time where they're gonna to want to come back around tail between their legs going, do you want a pair of sunglasses from us? You know, I think it's important for most luxury brands. I think some of them are very niche or within their own sort of lane that they can kind of do whatever they want because they're just, they just like have loyalists and whatever. I think a brand that can do that is Hermes and even they don't really push it that far as some of the other brands. But I think most luxury brands have to be careful and they have to cater to a wide range of luxury consumer in order to be successful. That used to be Gucci's superpower, was there was something for the top, top, top end customer and there was something for somebody buying their first designer bag, being introduced to the brand, 
beauty, shoes, sunglasses, accessories, whatever, small leather goods. And I think when you start to neglect that customer, it can turn around and bite you in the ass. And I think that a lot of them are forgetting that something that proves very valuable is loyalty and fair enough i think loyalty is a little bit harder to get in luxury at the moment just because of how many brands there are how many products are being dropped all of the time but i think if you're smart about it and if you're clever about it and you foster a customer from their first designer purchase you get those stories of oh my gosh my mum gave me this bag and then you know i bought my first pair of designer sunglasses from them and blah 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 that kind of loyalty that you can't just buy it has to be fostered i don't know if i'm making any sense so i kind of think that hopefully it won't be long until things sort of get back to a point where it's not as ridiculous as it is any thoughts of anything that i haven't covered within this that might be worth mentioning i don't know let me know what you think i'm going to leave a link to another video over here in case you haven't already seen it have an amazing morning afternoon or evening wherever you are and in the words of my father if you've enjoyed it tell your friends if you haven't keep your mouth shut i'll see you in my next video Mwah. bye guys